notorious for possessing two marijuana joints. He, he spent two years of it in prison, virtually in isolation, in solitary, in case he infiltrated the other prisoners or something. I was charged with being a member of a conspiracy to blow up the CIA recruiting office off the Michigan can University of Michigan campus in Ann Arbor. Wow. Who is this guy, man? <laughs> outlaw, dude, it's Outlaw Weekend. Uh, John Sinclair, an old friend of mine. I don't know. I guess he was in the hopper for a while. And I thought about him. I don't know why it came up this week, but um, he lives in Amsterdam now. But he was um, an old friend of mine who was the manager uh, of the MC5 with Wayne Kramer, who was a closer friend of mine who was in my band um, after years after the MC5, obviously in the 90s. I mean, Wayne played with a lot of people, but the MC5, uh, the Motor City 5, as they were called, uh, that's where MC5 comes from, right. um, was one of the uh, proto-type punk bands that come out of the, uh, the 60s Midwest rock scene, Um with a huge hit called, not huge hit, but a hit called Kick Out the Jam's Mother F's. Did Iggy uh, Pop ever run with them at all? Or did Yeah, they were best friends. They all they all okay. played the Grande Ballroom in Detroit. Um, uh, Bob Seger, which later was Bob Seger and the Silver Bullet Band, was part of that uh, scene, the a group called The Up. Uh, Iggy, obviously, they headlined many gigs together, uh, the, St the Stooges and... Um, the psychedelic stooges actually is what they were called again the psychedelic stooges but the mc5 and them headlined various uh gigs together yeah i think they they got credit um they're one of the progenitors of punk right the, them the ramones the, uh, hold on the yeah. um let's just take it a little closer down you're talking <laughs> about iggy or the uh mc5 it, MC5, I think, is definitely credited along oh, with Biggie yeah. Pop, okay, yeah. New yeah, York yeah. Dolls. Um, yeah, you know, like there's a few, and the yes. Ramones, I think, all get kind of thrown in that. Um, I sent you a picture. It's a cover, 1968 Rolling Stone cover, Rob Tyner and the MC5. That's how big they were. They made the cover of Rolling Stone January 19th. Yeah, there's the cover right there. I mean, this was not a small group in terms of rock and roll history and uh, inducted into the Hall of Fame. The, the, um, uh, song that they put out, interesting story, just to jump ahead a little bit in the story, but Kick Out the Jams uh, was the album that they released was a two night live album, I think was recorded um, October 31st and October 30th at the Grande Ballroom, 1968, it was released as one album. And uh, one of the songs, the name of the album was Kick Out the Jams. And one of the songs was that on there, the lead song was Kick Out the Jams Mofo, without saying it. Mm -hmm. So um, Hudson's, the department store in Detroit, which sold records also, uh, removed the record from their um, record bins. Uh, and it was a legitimate record on uh, Elektra. You know, they had mm -hmm. a major label. So they took out a full page ad in one of the alternative papers, essentially saying, F-U-C-K Hudson's, F Hudson's, the department store, uh, right. boycott Hudson's. And it, but it had the Electra logo on the bottom. So it gave the, the belief that Electra Records was doing this. And, and Jack Holtzman, who was the head of Electra, flipped out. And he flipped out for a reason. And that's because Hudson's removed every single record on the Electra label from the store. And Holtzman had a heart attack and fired, dropped the band uh, from the label, Electra. Uh, they would sign with Atlantic um, mm -hmm. moments later, but um, they had already gotten money for their albums. And had, Wayne bought a Stingray Corvette. They were all motorheads and gunheads. The, the reason I mentioned that I thought this band and this subject was important was for a couple of different reasons. One is they blew up the CIA headquarters in Ann Arbor, Michigan, with about seven sticks of dynamite. So they hated the CIA. And I wanted to show the audience how everything's reversed. They took action against the CIA who were recruiting on campus at the time at Ann Arbor, the University of Michigan at Ann Arbor. So they blew it up, right? Now, I'm not advocating that anybody does that, but that's mm -hmm. what these guys did because of the CIA uh, having offices. Now, 
they would come on stage with rifles, okay, and guitars, because they had to play music, but they brought rifles on stage. Rob Tyner, the lead singer who was named after McCoy Tyner, it wasn't his real name, McCoy Tyner, the uh, piano player for John Coltrane. They were into like a freeform jazz combined with Chuck Berry style rock and roll. So they combined the music of Archie Shepp, Albert Isla, Sun Ra, uh, Coltrane, with rock and roll, with Chuck Berry, uh, with that sound, that that rock and roll sound. And they came up with a, a new type of music, which they call free music or free jazz or new music. They had a bunch of names for it. it turned out to be punk. You know, years later, when they put a label on this, it became punk. But at the time, it didn't really have a label. So these guys were playing these shows at the Grandi Ballroom and in, in uh, Detroit. And they became a big thing in Detroit. And they'd come on stage with rifles, Eric, which, of course, doesn't happen that often. So, no. <laughs> at, at, right. So the show, the show would end with a sniper, a sniper shooting off a gun in another direction. Uh, but Mick, Rob Tyner, the singer, would make believe he was assassinated and collapse on stage. Oh, wow. And that was that's how the shows ended. <laughs> with a with a with a gun blast by a sniper shooting in a, up in the air, and wow. him acting, yeah, a little provocative, a little provocative. <laughs> and considering they, the the future later on with um, uh, oh god, I forget the there was a a speed metal band with a guy who got clipped on stage. I could just see where <laughs> it probably wouldn't go over well now. Anyway, the reason I mention this is this is a band that hated the CIA and was pro Second Amendment. Okay, mm. and this was part, and they had thousands and thousands of fans in the Midwest. They were as far left as you could possibly go on the face of the earth. You couldn't go any further left than the MC5. They were Maoists. Mm. They were Maoists. They formed a group under John Sinclair called the White Panther Party. They took target practice with the Black Panther Party. And they were allies of the Black Panther Party. They issued a 10-point program mirroring the um, uh, Black Panthers. And they would um, uh, got involved in community activities, opening up a, a free food uh, uh, distribution network, a, a, an alternative newspaper. They took over a house. They got a house in Ann Arbor. This is before they got, before John gets to Ann Arbor. He's in Detroit. This is the house that they took over uh, in Ann Arbor. They took over two houses. I think that was the one you're looking at there is 1510 Hill Street. They also took over 1520 Hill Street next door. And in there would put recording equipment and musical stuff and, and that nature. And Iggy and these other guys would all hang out there. And they had a lot of poetry readings and, and different things of that nature, making a newspaper, making furniture, making shirts. Um, it was a whole collective, let me put it that way, called Trans Love Energies. Trans Love Energies comes from, oddly enough, the Donovan song that says, fly trans love airways mm. gets you there on time. <laughs> Later on, I think in the lyrics, he says, fly Jefferson airplane, also Donovan for reasons I don't understand. But um, <laughs> that's where the, the Trans Love commune came from and Trans Love Energies came from. But form these two houses and they believe in smoking pot, which becomes another contemporary situation that's gone full circle. They are ahead of the curve on a lot of stuff that is today uh, quite contemporary. So John Sinclair gets arrested on, on a couple of occasions for possession of marijuana. And he's kind of framed for doing this because they are, uh, espousing radical views, Eric, and the police are not happy with their radical views. The police are not happy with their long hair. Police are not happy that this rock band is leading a cult uh, or community, whichever way you want to look at it. Uh, John also plays alto saxophone. He occasionally jams with the band, uh, but he's also a poet. This is before he even hooks up with the band. He's a published poet working out of Detroit and in um uh, an art community in Detroit called the uh, the Art Workshop or Jazz Workshop or Poetry Workshop. He has a name for the official title of it, but changed names a couple of times. So John uh, comes out of Detroit's family, basically working class. All of them worked, came from the farm 
into automotives like everyone else did. Mm -hmm. Everybody ends up on the assembly line in his family. Everybody works from Detroit uh, automotive concerns. And that takes him and a lot of people like him and his family out of the fields. Mm. Well, that was the time, too, that it was multi-generational. I think Detroit was the largest city in America at that time, or it was, it was really close. But like late 60s, early 70s, Detroit was huge. Right. And it, it's just completely has fallen apart over time. But at that well, time, we're going to we're going to get to the reasons it fell apart. It didn't just fall apart, it fell apart in 1967 because of the, the uh, burning of the city to the ground uh, mm -hmm. during the Detroit riots. But up until this point, he comes out of Flint, Michigan, just like some other guy we know named Michael Moore came out of Flint, Michigan. Mm -hmm. this, there is a leftist uh marxist bent that comes out of that area of the country roger uh, me put uh, michael moore on the map about right him. yeah yeah roger me but later on a million yeah. other films you know but he comes from the thumb up there in uh that michigan area which looks like a thumb to people in michigan and he uh, be becomes a poet and he starts hanging out with blacks and beatniks in Detroit, and that becomes his whole world, John, is his black uh, beatnik world. He sees Malcolm X come and speak at his school, and he says the idea of me ever becoming or staying a white liberal goes out the window with him seeing Malcolm X shred these progressives and white liberals at his school uh, mm -hmm. in this, this appearance by Malcolm X, whatever that is. And he forms, like I said, he forms a group called the White Panthers. Uh, he went to Albion College in 1960, dropped out after his first year, then goes to University of Michigan at Flint, uh, where this happens, and um, gets involved in uh, 60s activism. But he's also uh, writing as a jazz critic for Downbeat, and he has a legitimate career as a writer of poetry and jazz uh, critiques and things of that nature. So he dabbles in playing the horn, uh, alto saxophone, and worships John Coltrane. Uh, John Coltrane will make anyone stop playing the horn, but which is, I think, what happened with John Sinclair. Uh, his mother, oddly enough, which is something John told me off the cuff one day, Elsie Sinclair, his mother was a teacher. The father and the uncles all worked in the, in the, in the motor uh, uh, industry on the on the uh, on the line as they say right eric You're working mm -hmm. on the line the mother taught was a teacher oddly enough an obscure guy who he will later come to know named abby hoffman mm. which we have an episode about if anybody want to, wants to that see guy? abby and there's a picture of abby and john yeah uh I, I, abby obviously from worcester mass and john being from michigan but very similar working class, middle class backgrounds of the two guys. Um, John here on the right, I, I think this is around the time he went to jail. So he gets arrested in a 56 person pot ring sting around the college and everybody gets released, makes all the papers um, and everyone gets released except for John. And they say that he's the ringleader of this pot ring. Now, keep in mind, this is pot. This mm -hmm. is not heroin. This is not acid, although he's, he's starting to do acid. Um, they're not really doing hard drugs. The band, on the other hand, begins to do hard drugs. The band gets invited to perform with other bands. All these huge bands get, <laughs> to get invited to perform at the Festival of Life in 1968 by Abby Hoffman at the Chicago Democratic Convention, which again is going to be coming up in 2024, again in Chicago, again with Grant Park, again with the same situation politically as was happening in 1968. A corrupt president, Democratic president with low poll numbers, with a un uh, an unliked war, this time in the Ukraine, then in Vietnam, uh, corruption involved on both presidents, uh, up for re-election. One of them bails. We don't know where this guy's going to go. We have an RFK Jr. running this time. We had an RFK running that time. A lot of similarities. So they get invited, the MC5, 
and all these other super groups from the West Coast uh, get invited to play the Festival of Life. And it's going to be in Grant Park. So the word spreads that there's going to be physical trouble. You know, Mayor Daly comes out and says, we're going to shoot to kill, uh, blah, blah, blah. The guys who show up become the Chicago 7. Uh, Abby Hoffman and Jerry Rubin, Rennie Davis, William Kunstler becomes their lawyer. Bobby Seal becomes Chicago 8. Um, he gets got chained and gagged to the chair. The judge is named Hoffman, just like Abby Hoffman, but there's no relation. Uh, make a long story short, the only group that shows up is the MC5. And there's some little pieces of home movies. I don't know if you, if you have a, a clip of any of this. There's very, very little about the five playing there or anybody playing there maybe this can uh, show this and we can and i'll just find it, it's it's interspersed in there right where... right there's a little snippet of them playing which i wanted to see if we could find because um this is see. dod footage by the way if i recall yeah that's right that's right this is from surveillance they had been they had been infiltrated by the fbi the FBI infiltrated uh, this group in Grant Park, infiltrated the protesters. They had numerous Ray Epps types that were infiltrating uh, the group. Um, here we go. Here you yeah. go. There's Wayne. You'll see on the extreme right is John Sinclair. You'll see Fred Sonic 6. This will come back around in a second. This is uh, um, undercover footage by uh, either Chicago Intelligence or Department of Defense Intelligence uh, operatives there in Grant Park. You see, John is in the extreme right in that white shirt. If you look over right there, uh, yeah, oh, all the way oh, on the right, all the way on the right. There he was, uh, arms folded. That's John Sinclair. And the singer is Rob Tyner with the big afro. And on the left is Wayne Kramer, uh, who's a close friend of mine, uh, who will later be in. There's Wayne with the sunglasses and, and the darker jacket there, talking to, I think, Fred. And it's good that we can find footage without music because we're getting claimed left and right, folks. So anyway, the, 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 the they don't care about your problems. This is their band <laughs> playing right here, Eric's Family Band back in 1968. Mm -hmm. That's Hunley on the left. And uh, this is the adopted family that took Hunley in in 1968. There's Eric learning how to play the bongos. He would later go on to form his own salsa act and play in Vegas in 1972. Okay. Uh, I think that's all we have to see of this thing. But the reality of it is, the, uh, he said one time Wayne said to me, the only guy who did show up on his own was Neil Young. Uh, Phil Oak and didn't play because he got caught up in something at the convention. And I want you know when I run into RFK when we do this junior thing, like I said, I wonder what his plan is to physically get onto the floor of the convention. I've mentioned this twice on this show, and I'll, I will yeah. ask him when I see him what his physical plan is, because I don't think he's getting an invitation to speak at the, at the Chicago 2024 Democratic Convention. That being said, uh, there was pushing and shoving in the 1968 Democratic Convention. Credentials were yanked. It became a free-for-all on the floor. You remember that uh, um, uh, a, a, a guy from CBS News who would later become the anchorman, Dan Rather, was shoved and punched in the face repeatedly by Mayor Daley's delegates. Uh, I can see a similar situation going on with protests to the left of Biden and the Democratic Party, like happened in 1968. These people were not happy with the nominee who became Hubert H. Humphrey out of Minnesota, uh, a milquetoast, middle-of-the-road Democrat who was a uh, puppet of LBJ, who was his puppet master pulling the strings on Hubert H. Humphrey, um, who uh, was closing the gap on Nixon. Very, If that election would have lasted another week, he would have caught him, according to uh, uh, pollsters and experts at the time. He, was, he closed a huge gap, Humphrey, uh, in the last month and a half of the election uh, cycle there. But that being said, the, the band uh, is now linked to John Sinclair and his radical Maoist policies, and they are part of this group uh, called the White Panther Party. And John and these, this guy, Larry Pun, who was, I think, Native American, he had a longer name, Pun and Dundrum or something, and a third man are arrested for blowing up the CIA headquarters in 
uh, Ann Arbor, which was a secret office that they had for recruitment near or on the campus. He is now held incommunicado, John, uh, because of the uh, situation with the dynamite of blowing up the CIA. Now, these people are released, and John is not released. They're released on bail. Pun goes underground, doesn't surface for a number of years. Later, when Pun does surface, he becomes a roadie for Kiss, oddly enough, later in his life. You can't make this stuff up, folks. He becomes a roadie for Kiss and just, you know, blends into the uh, underground of rock and roll culture in the United States. But John, it, they want to blame John for blowing up the... Uh, this is um, pun. oh, this pun. Yeah, yeah. He, he looks uh, the ones I saw later. He had his head shaved and his beard shaved. A Native American guy. He was directly involved, although nobody would really take credit for it on paper for blowing up the CIA. But I'm pointing it out now because there's so many similarities. Completely... What's that? Oh, you it's froze. Not... You froze completely. But hopefully, it's fine. hopefully the the situation will resolve itself. But. The similarities to today's news is breathtaking. So you've got an unpopular war. You've got a CIA that's that's really draconian. You've got an FBI that's then infiltrated. And the reason I'm mentioning this is because they are uh, put on trial for bombing the CIA and they are wiretapped by the federal government. They're wiretapped by the FBI. And you say, well, what's the big deal? What does that mean? In discovery, Eric, they request the surveillance tapes of their own wiretaps. And Ooh. that's right. So Mitchell, who is the attorney general, refuses to give them the wiretaps. Now, why does Mitchell refuse to give them the wiretaps? Well, under the, the Safe Streets Act of 1968, a bill that uh, allowed the federal government, if there was an attempt to overthrow it, to not have to get warrants for wiretaps, even with domestic surveillance. Now, keep in mind, 1978 is when the FISA court is created, and that's the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. This is domestic. And what the Nixon administration did was create a law through, through their congressional help that did not necessarily require a search warrant, Eric, so when Mitchell refused to turn over the f surveillance tapes, he cited this Safe Street Acts of 1968 bill that allowed them to not have to get a warrant for people that were threatening to overthrow the United States government domestically. Domestically. This case, this particular little case, becomes United States versus the United States District Court a landmark case with John Sinclair and Pun involved, AKA the Keith case, because the guy's name was, his last name, the judge, a black judge named Keith, who was considered to be a liberal uh, judge. It, he, it goes to the United States Supreme Court, Eric, and they vote eight to nothing, citing the Fourth Amendment in a landmark decision that Barnes is well aware of, and we will discuss whenever we see Barnes, uh, this particular case is because of the MC5 indirectly, John Sinclair, Lawrence Pun, uh, Plamondon, and John Forrest in a conspiracy to blow up the Central Intelligence Agency. This declares that the Nixon Safe Streets Act is unconstitutional. The only man who doesn't uh, vote is William Rehnquist, the Nixon appointee, by the way. So it's eight to nothing, not nine to nothing, the, uh, the vote in the Supreme Court. The judge's name was Damon Keith of the United States District Court for the Eastern District of Michigan. Um, he ordered the government to disclose all their illegally intercepted conversations to the defendants. The government appealed, filing a petition for a writ of mandamus with the Court of Appeals in the 6th. 6th also rejected the government's arguments. Eventually goes to the Supreme Court uh, where a 6-0 uh, uh, defeat, 8 uh, nothing defeat is handed to um, the Nixon administration. Um, and freeing everyone, again, except John Sinclair, who is still there on a beef of two joints that he gave to a female undercover operative. Uh, the sentencing of John Sinclair, which could be seen in that article. 
Sinclair is sentenced to nine and a half years in state prison for two joints. I'm going to say that again because it's so insane. Nine and a half years. He's face, he was facing 20 to life. He got nine and a half years. He was in there for over two and a half years in solitary confinement quite a bit of the time in a hell hole in the Detroit uh, jail. Okay. What happens is Jerry Rubin, the activist and friend of Abby Hoffman, um, finds out about John Sinclair being in there, contacts a guy in New York named John Lennon. And he tells John Lennon the story of the incarceration of John Sinclair. And they put together a John Sinclair, um, that's Ruben on the left, Yoko, obviously Abby Hoffman on the right, that's in Greenwich Village, and John Lennon there next to Abby. Um, they put together a John Sinclair Freedom Rally concert at the Chrysler uh, Arena in Detroit. And they, and they put together a bill, this is on December 10th, a bill of John Lennon, Yoko Ono, Stevie Wonder, Bob Seeger, Commander Cody, Bobby Seale, Allen Ginsberg, Phil Oaks, Archie Shep, Roswell Rudd, who was my music teacher at Bard College, by the way, <laughs> Rennie Davis, Dave Dillinger, I mean, Stevie Wonder, I mean, there's footage of this. I mean, if you can find the footage of this, David Peel of uh, David Peel on the Lower East Side, and they hold this rally on behalf of John Sinclair, and they somehow are able to get him on the phone through a circuitous uh, deception in the prison where his wife calls from the stage and then John gets on the phone. He starts crying. He's so petrified. He's not um, uh, overcome by emotion. He's afraid that after the show, after the phone call, they're going to come in and beat the living shit out of him. So because that's how vicious this 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 jail was. Mm -hmm. So two days, oh, this is what John Lennon, I don't know if we have a recording or maybe we can't play it or maybe we can't play it. I don't really know if we can or can't, but we'll play it maybe on the uh, locals page, the locals Right, Eric. We can play it on. Uh, yeah, okay. I have a I have a, a phone call between him and um, between the two Johns. Oh yeah, play yeah. that. Play that. But that's after. Let me just finish this because that's okay. after. That's after what happens. Okay. So so John Lennon shows up. And it's somewhere in New York. The album that he, that he was making. Um, he writes a song called John Sinclair, and it's dedicated to John Sinclair, and it's about mm -hmm. literally John Sinclair being in prison, 10 for 2, 10 for 2. So the whole tour becomes a 10 for 2 concert uh, tour of, of them doing this. And he's got Yoko, he's got a band. It kind of became, I think, the Plastic Ono band years later. It wasn't the Plastic Ono band yet. They would play the Toronto uh, uh, Festival up there in Toronto and Canada, 72. Um, but what Lennon does is he writes this song out of whole cloth. Man, he dedicates it to John Sinclair and he shows up and they're playing um, Dobros, like a, a steel guitar, steel Dobros. And it's kind of an acoustic thing. And he's got a bass player and Yoko is on some Tom Tom or something. And uh, but it's a beautiful little song, uh, really well crafted, well sung by John. It's totally a Lennon song, totally Lennon esque, um, beautifully done. Within 72 hours, he's freed from prison. Within 72 hours of that concert, they will change the marijuana laws. They're so embarrassed. The state of Michigan will decriminalize marijuana because of this concert, because of the humiliation, embarrassment, and focus of the light of public opinion on this travesty of putting a man in prison for two joints for 10 years. They will change, and it will be the first uh, decriminalization of marijuana in Michigan because of John. John is now released 72 hours after the concert. He has no idea what's going on. The warden says they, they're bringing him down to the warden and he thinks he's going to the hole, which he had been in before. He thinks he's going to the hole because he'd been in the hole uh, for, for acting up in jail. And he had this phone call with his wife and he's quite paranoid and sure that they're aware of it. So when they bring him to the warden, uh, the warden says to him, get your stuff. You're getting out of here. And he goes, what? And then there's footage of him coming out with his legal papers and everything else. But he gets a call in the morning from this particular guy on the phone. Hello? John, okay, here's John. You're on tape now. Yeah. Hello? 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 <laughs> Hello, John? Yeah. Great. <laughs> so there you are, right? Right. Here we are. Really? Great. Yes, yes. So yes, what yes. happened? I don't know, man. 
they just so told me to go. It's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> Great. That thing, you know, it did it, man. It's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, the Supreme Court of the state of Michigan, man, they granted a bond on their own motion. Beautiful. They made it up themselves. Right. But he's never on them. Yes, right. <laughs> <laughs> How's <laughs> Yoko? Oh, she's fine. Yeah. Used, uh, oh, great, hello pretty good. Hello, John. Hey. Hi, how are you? Good. Well, look, we're so glad. You know, it really gave us hope and everything. Hello. I mean, you know, it became like history, right? Really? I heard you. I heard you on the radio. You could totally hear the emotion in his voice. Though. Yeah, like, I mean, oh, oh my God, I mean, so yeah, rattled. Yeah, he was kind of rattled, but I mean, they were partying for a couple of days when he got out, and um, they, they, because of that, like I said, they changed the laws in the state of Michigan because of John Sinclair. When it becomes legalized, I think in two thousand nine or what, recently, I think. Yeah, John is the first guy to go buy <laughs> legal weed in Michigan. Uh, what year is that, Eric? Uh, the article's written in 2019. And I, I, saying, I, I think it's roughly around that time. Yeah. Um, right? And he came back, He moved wherever he was, he came back to buy marijuana as a symbolic act because he had been writing for High Times. He'd been writing for uh, alternative newspapers about the legalization of marijuana. It became his uh, major political uh, um, focus for 20, 30 years. And it finally came to fruition because of all these little things of guys like him going to jail. Now, whether you agree with it or not is a separate issue. I mean, you know, about marijuana or what it's, it's, it's places in American society, mm. but just to show you the draconian shift in law did not come easily, did not come without people doing something of getting off their ass, which is what I urge people to do today. Um, there seems to be a lot of recalcitrance about doing that and, and, today's society, but the, the events were quite similar then. Uh, I'm not, again, not advocating the blowing up the CIA, but this is what they felt they had to do for an unjust war, not unlike what's going on in Ukraine, in my humble opinion. So they, I'll tell you where this, they open up a bunch of these uh, white Panther parties around the country, right? So one of them's in San Francisco. They have a white Panther party in San Francisco. So what, what happens in San Francisco? There's a mayor who, uh, says that handguns are illegal now in San Francisco. She passes a city ordinance, 1983, saying handguns are illegal. The White Panther Party, uh, started by John Sinclair, gets a petition of recall against the mayor of San Francisco over the Second Amendment issue. Mm. This is why there's such strange, bed strange bedfellows in this story. The mayor... They get enough signatures to recall the mayor, and she had an odd, obscure name. Her name was Diane Feinstein. No, oh, God. And through <laughs> Sinclair and the White Panther Party, Diane Feinstein uh, gets recalled as mayor, uh, and there's another vote afterwards. But they had enough signatures because of the White Panther Party and the Second Amendment to recall the actual mayor of San Francisco, like they recalled the district attorney of San Francisco last year. Uh, the attempt to recall the district attorney in L.A. was uh, sabotaged uh, by the guy throwing out hundreds of thousands of legitimate signatures without showing any uh, signature uh, comparisons like similar to the lake situation. Now, did he get big on the Second Amendment because of Malcolm X? Because I know Malcolm no, X no, 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 really absolutely not. the Second Amendment uh, as well. No, not really because of Malcolm X. It was Midwest, you know, rural politics, Eric. They, they mm. were gun people. This was Michigan. Remember, mm -hmm. in the 70s, there were tons of militias on the right in Michigan uh, that 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 toted guns. The, the idea that a band would come on stage with rifles and machine guns, I mean, it, it only reminds me of the Black Panthers going into the state house in Sacramento. Well, Ted uh, Nugent, and, I guess. <laughs> yeah, or Ted Nugent. But the Black Panthers went into the state house in Sacramento, California with, with shotguns. Uh, scaring the bejesus out of legislators uh, in 1967, I believe it was, uh, with leather jackets, berets, and shotguns. You want to talk about a terrifying image. Um, and uh, maybe it came from that. I think it probably did because they were close to Bobby Seale. Mm -hmm. But the, the, the gun part, I think, is just Midwestern Second Amendment uh, blue-collar ethic as, as rural people. Okay. I, I wasn't sure because I did want to point out that Black Panthers love the Second Amendment as well. A lot of people but, don't but, like hearing it, but it's true. 
Well, that's why I wanted to do this story, because it covers both ends of the political spectrum. There's a lot of similarities, like we discussed with Jose Vega and like we discussed with uh, um, Stein 99, who is apparently dressing up in Target right now as we speak, <laughs> putting on uh, <laughs> women's bathing suits. If you want to see uh, that after the show, you're more than welcome. We'll direct you there. So anyway, John starts working for local radio. He begins to put a blues uh, and, and jazz orchestra together and begins to perform uh, jazz poetry with music in back of him. He taught me how to do it. I would later put a band together. I learned from John how to do it. There was another friend of ours out of England named Mick Farron, who ran the White Panther Party out of uh, England, who tore down the fences of the Isle of Wight Rock Festival. Uh, Mick Farron was in a band called the Pink Fairies, which was a... Um, a, a, a pretty advanced band for England. But if, if some of our English fans know the Pink Fairies, I think uh, um, they will recall Mick Farron, who was a brilliant, prolific science fiction writer and rock and roll artist um, who lived pretty close to me here in England, uh, in LA, died here in LA about 10 years ago. But anyway, so there was one bill, where I think we were all at Spaceland or somewhere here in LA. It was me and Sinclair and Mick Farron with three different bands playing one night. Anyway, so he gets into this um, orchestration and, and having bands in back of him doing spoken word poetry with a band in back of him. He becomes the father of that. It becomes John Sinclair and the blues scholars uh, among various connotations. He gets these incredible musicians, sometimes with entire horn sections, with, with violins. I mean, he's all kinds of different combinations. This is my favorite one of the album. He's got a bunch of albums out. This one's called Full Circle. I think it came out in the mid late nineties uh, with Wayne and the Blue Scholars. Highly recommended. Um, I don't think we could play it because of copyright stuff, but um, no. this is one of my favorite of uh, John Sinclair's albums. So Sinclair and I become friends here in LA and, you know, begin to roll around. Turns out that he's a huge baseball fan, grew up watching the Detroit Tigers. So of course we have to go to a baseball game in LA, we also went, oh, we also went to a baseball game at Yankee Stadium. I just remembered that. We're sitting in the right field bleachers at Yankee Stadium where they have a guy who weighs about 400 pounds who is an usher named Tiny. And Tiny the usher is known by all of the people who sit in the right, the old Yankee Stadium, not the new Yankee Stadium, the old Yankee Stadium. They all know Tiny because Tiny, he, he, has another job. He's a prison guard at Rikers Island. So they all know Tiny from Rikers Island. And if you act out, Tiny points to you and just goes, you're out of here. And you got to leave the right field bleachers. And John just thought this was the funniest thing he'd ever seen in his life. So people, if you throw a beer, if you get into a fight, this 450 pound prison guard named Tiny comes over and tosses you from Yankee Stadium and you got to leave with a badge of honor. They get applause. They stand up in the section. Anyway, don't <laughs> get me started on this Yankee right field stuff. Uh, I took him that we went to Dodger Stadium. We went to buy a pair of sneakers. I mean, he's always smoking weed. So it become, you know, in the mid 90s, it wasn't as loose as it is now. Here's a shot of me and John buying uh, 800 pounds of weed. I was no, wondering. I, you know, no, I don't even know what I, I, I don't even know what the money. Yeah, I don't even know what the money was. <laughs> I don't know what the money was for, but that's a shot of me and John here in LA. Uh, I think circa 1997, and probably. But um, I don't know what that cash was about. I, don't, I forget. But it it wasn't anything illegal. I'll tell you that much. But anyway, so John and Wayne and I, you know, became very close friends. Wayne then playing in my band, Mark Robear and the Blues Pros, um, where we played around town, but. John, um, Lee, he gets onto a job at uh, National Public Radio playing blues in Detroit. He then moves to New Orleans where he gets a job as a ra uh, again, as another famous high end radio blues guy. I think a National Public Radio station out of, D out of uh, New Orleans. I forget what the name of the station was. Probably people out there probably know what it was. But he begins to um, develop a following in New Orleans. He marries a black chick named Penny, a doll, a wonderful woman. And he becomes, um, uh, his first wife was, was Lenny. She was German. And he had a daughter with her. Um, uh, he eventually gets divorced. She becomes a pretty famous photographer. Um, another, her I didn't know, but Penny I knew pretty well um, out of New Orleans. And 
that's the German one. That's Lenny. That's uh, the first wife. And that's uh, John on the right, kind of a clean cut college era. <laughs> John Sinclair. So his wife's name's rhymed, Lenny and Penny. Uh, only you could figure that out. But the point of the matter is <laughs> well, I don't know. <laughs> one white, one black. I, I don't know mm -hmm. what that means. But the reality of it is he begins to uh, have this radio show in um, New Orleans that becomes pretty, pretty prominent down there. And, and I would go down and visit him. We'd all go and visit him in New Orleans. And, and he became like the mayor of New Orleans, you know, for a long period of time. He was, you know, running the social scene in the town. And uh, so it was great to go see him. In fact, first time I went to see him, I was on the other side of a park and looking for his house. And I asked somebody for the address. And the guy said, that's on the other side of Congo Square. And I said, all right, can I cut through the park? He goes, you can, but no one's ever made it. I go, what? He goes, yeah, you don't want to do that. It's really crime ridden. Now, this is 12 o'clock at night. You know what I mean? So, oh, yeah. yeah in so, New Orleans, no, 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 no. In New Orleans, the Garden District and um, the French Quarter, it's like a no person's land between them. Well, anyway, so I took a cab around the thing, got to his house, and I stayed with John for a while. But the, re the reality of it is he eventually begins to become a judge of the Cannabis Cup in Amsterdam, right? <laughs> For he gets a, like an honorary job as the High Times magazine judge of the Cannabis Cup in Amsterdam. So they'll fly him to Amsterdam where he'll judge. This is, the, I, I want to say, 2002, 2004, roughly. And he would judge the um, various strains of cannabis at this event. So he <laughs> told me this story. He gets to leave Amsterdam and he takes out his bag, puts it on the belt, and these German shepherds start barking at his bag. So they open up the bag. These guys have Uzis, by the way, submachine guns. They, they mean business at that airport. This was, a, I think, in the late 90s, early 2000s. They were heavily armed in the uh, Dutch airport. And they take out his book that the dogs are barking at, and it's the Holy Bible. So these German shepherds are barking nonstop at the Holy Bible. And I said, what was that about? And he says, that was my way of distracting the dogs. I would roll joints from pages inside the Bible. So the smell of the weed would only be on this one book. And it would look weird if German shepherds were barking at the Christian Bible. And indeed, that's exactly what happened. The dogs went crazy. They were embarrassed that it was the Bible. The guards put the Bible back in the book and they let John go on his way with his weed, which was in his back pocket. But it was his method of distracting the animals away from the weed that he was that was on him, whatever. But he will eventually move, I think, I want to say 2009 or 2007 to Amsterdam, become a citizen of Amsterdam, where he is today, um, doing poetry and doing the uh, marijuana thing and rolling 10 foot joints and judging quality of uh, uh, of the of the pot over there. But. He now, he's, I think he's 82, I want to say, and living in Amsterdam. I mean, he was, you know, he was always a huge guy. Um, and I don't know if he took care of himself. He must have. He's 82 years old. Somehow he's, he's still alive, which very few of his contemporaries are. Let me put it that way. Yeah, he seems all right. I found a, a birthday wish from his 79th birthday. Okay. When, but, when was that? Like three years ago, or now? Uh, I I don't know when it was when it happened. Um, but I'll say, I think he was born in 1941, so around there, 1940, 1941, 1941. Yeah, so that would make him 51, 61, 71, 81, 91, 2001, 2011, 2020. Yeah, 80. He's 82 years old. Uh, anyway, it's also Viva's birthday, so I asked on in, on Twitter how old he was, the $6 million question. <laughs> and people are going like, yeah, he does have a, well, it's great that you asked him that. You know, people, were, he does have a thing about his birth, about people's birthdays. And he said he was a perfect 44. Yeah, he has, that's an interesting photo. And he looks pretty good. Uh, looks yeah, that was like four years ago. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, he looks pretty good. Three or four years ago. Yeah, I, I'm telling you, the guy has a contagious sense of humor. He's absolutely the loosest guy I've ever met in my life. He's a blast to be around. 
I've always had a great time with John, um, whether it's in New York or whether it's in L.A. or whether it's in New Orleans. I mean, he is an American original and he was considered the Midwestern Abby Hoffman. And Abby was that kind of a guy. There's John. I mean, he was just and is. He looks jovial. He's a jovial cat. He really is. He loves life. He loves music. He loves blues. He loves jazz. And he loves America. And one of the reasons I wanted to do that is that, you know, people look at these guys like they were a lot of the radical left were scum, but not so much the working class ones that the people who really were scummy were the people in the weather underground who came. The from, yeah, the, right. The ones that came from corporate fathers and 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 money tended to be ideologically rigid without senses of humor and douchebags. John and Abby were not that. Uh, I don't know what happened to Jerry Rubin. He kind of lost his mind and went to work for Wall Street. But, you know, Abby talks about John in his book, Woodstock Nation. He talks about him in, in a bunch of different periodicals. They were kind of like political brothers in a lot of ways, you know, with John um, being involved in the Midwest version while Abby was in New York and John being in, in Michigan and, in you know, in the center of the country. Um, there was a whole different sensibility of radicalism there that wasn't as um, uh, dubious as it was in other places. It was much more sincere, is all I could say. You know what I mean? They, no, it's factory. Probably a very factory driven. Because they came yeah. from factories. Their families yeah. worked in factories. Their their fathers worked in factories. The mothers were the secretary in the factories. All yeah. of these guys came from that background. Now, you know, uh, look, am I advocating to uh, blow shit up? I don't know. We'll have to see what happens. You know, we're yeah. we're at a, we're at a particular place now where. You know, as I've said on a numerous uh, occasions, people have to begin to get off their fat asses and do something, which is why I wanted to do this episode. I'm not advocating what John and and the others were accused of doing, whether they did it or not, allegedly. The uh, but something's got to be done, and what these guys did, and what the punk ethos created was an environment of not being an expert. And I learned a lot of this from Les McNeil, by the way. Uh, who wrote Please Kill Me with my roommate in Valley Village for a number of years. You didn't have to know anything about anything to do anything with these people. Like, there's a lot of us who say, well, I got to get a degree in that before I can do it. Not punks. Punks will just say, yeah, I could build a bridge and just start building a bridge. They don't care if it fails or not. You know what I mean? There's a certain uh, can-do-it aspect of the punk uh, scene that I always liked. Even the music, it's like, um, well, what the music, is it? obviously, yeah, Lou Reed but, is like three chords. What, what is that? Except right, but 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 they <laughs> they carried it out in other parts of their mm -hmm. lives, is what I'm saying. And they, you know, whether it was building a, a bridge or or take or a new career or a job, they did not give a crap about failing. A lot right. of people have fear of failure, these people couldn't give a crap about failing, they were into action. And I got to respect that. I'm not a big punk music fan, but I got to respect their ethos on how to live a life of doing things without being an expert or having a sheepskin in order to do something. I mean, Legs did a lot of weird stuff that he didn't know how to do, and he did it anyway, as did a lot of people around him, uh, like the Ramones and others who did not go to music school. Let me put it that way. You know, Perfect is the enemy of done. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, John comes from that school also. I mean, he had, he dropped out of college and he went and got a degree and something, but it didn't have anything to do with anything. He started an alternative newspaper, The Sun. He wrote poetry, self-published. He put out these albums. Everything he did was self. And he didn't wait for a record deal to come his way to make these albums. He didn't wait for a book deal to make books. He didn't wait for somebody like a Rupert Murdoch to create a newspaper in, in Ann Arbor. I mean, it's a, it's a can-do, it's self driven thing that we need today more than ever if we're going to get around these media blockades that seem to have become more and more of a gatekeeper mentality stopping us from getting the word out and i think in 1965 67 69 they were faced with the same situation they couldn't get the word out that whether you believe the word that they were saying or not is irrelevant mm -hmm. i'm not backing their politics I'm just saying they used methods that they created to get the word out that they wanted to reach people with. And I think we need a lot more of that today if we're going to survive the, the rejection of Section 230 by the United States Supreme Court the other day.
I mean, we can't just sit around waiting for manna to fall from heaven anymore, folks, uh, which I've stated before. Yeah, I agree. And and it continued on. Um, somebody in the chat just said punk didn't last that long, and I disagree. Punk lasted a long time because it got absorbed yeah, into yeah. the rest of rock and roll, and the yeah. ethos became part of rock. I mean, right. Well, that's a that's a show for another day. But the but they're right. I mean, you're right. It it did get absorbed, and the ethos got absorbed into a lot of parts of American life. Uh, not enough, as far as I could see, but still quite a bit where it's a, it's a can do atmosphere. Of, of making things happen. The people that I meet today who are in their 20s, it's a sad, sad lot, Eric. I mean, these people are just sitting around waiting for something to happen. I mean, it's the opposite. It's almost like, you know, the, the you know, the, what was the name of that group that the Idiot Society or the, um, you know, the Do Nothings or whatever. I mean, these people are beaten down and sad. The punks that I knew, the ones that, that were doing this stuff, just said, let's go. Let's go build this thing or take apart a car or we'll figure it out as we go. Hey, you know, no, and, let's go. <laughs> yeah. You know, they they would snort Carbona. They'd inhale Carbona. And <laughs> you'd, be, you'd be ready to roll. Now, you know, John talks about, um, you know, how much LSD they took and, and, and how they were uh, revved up to do different things. And he said, you know, you put 20 people on acid, taking it every week for six months, you're going to do a lot of strange things, but you're going to do something. And he, he talks about that in a bunch of interviews. And his interviews are, I strongly recommend, maybe we could put a couple up in uh, locals, to listen to John, just free form talk. He, he would go up before a college audience and just without any notes, you know, pontificate on this stuff. And... Um, uh, be able to, uh, you know, run a musical operation and also to to speak freely about these ideas that he believes in. You know, uh, later John Lennon will famously say, "We we we tried flower power, folks. It didn't work. Now we got to try something else." He says, "That's why I'm wearing this Chairman Mao badge." So he Lennon went from flower power to to an embracing of violence as a means of political ends by his own admission. You know whether that worked or not um, is yet to be seen. You know, history will write that that book. But, you know, they went as far left as they could go. Um, and Lenin will eventually be depoliticized by the United States versus John Lennon, where Nixon goes after him with the full weight of the Justice Department to get him deported. Why? Because of the tool that 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 John Sinclair talked about, the tool being marijuana laws they were used as a political tool and once they were the fact that it was considered to be a narcotic was of course as john said absurd it was considered and made a narcotic and a felony so it could be used as a political weapon against people like john lennon and john sinclair when it became decriminalized they couldn't do it anymore and that's what took the teeth out of the political weaponization of the marijuana laws it wasn't about marijuana. It was about using it, a substance that was so pervasive through the culture that they could then take anyone, put two joints on them and put them away for 20 years. That's what John Sinclair changed. He didn't change it so people could just smoke weed all day and night. He changed it because it was being used as a political weapon. And that's, what, that's the reason that his political legend lives on. It's weird. I mean, just looking at the, the laws and how they changed it, you can see how arbitrary mm -hmm. it actually is because um, I obviously didn't live through prohibition. You're a little closer, but, you know, I'll, I'll wait, give you credit wait, to say that it's wait, before your time. Wait, wait a minute. But, but we have seen that where literally, you know, something is completely forbidden, illegal, locked up, go to prison to it's legal all over the place. And they're well, even I, reversing I, sentences, throwing things out, because this is an arbitrary decision. That One day we say it's illegal. Next day we say it's not. It just seems weird. Well, I don't know if there, maybe there's some examples of it. I don't know if there was a politicalization of, um, of the liquor prohibition. In other words, I, I think the mob moved in, started to make bootleg liquor, the Purple Gang out of Detroit, sure. uh, certain mob elements. But I don't think they used it as a political weapon against their political enemies. I mean, there was prohibition that came down and then they finally realized that they were losing the liquor tax under FDR mm -hmm. and they, they uh, changed the prohibition back to legalization. 
what they did with marijuana was they used it against blacks to begin with to to incarcerate blacks and black jazz musicians and others then they used it against white radicals and college kids who guys who didn't want to go to vietnam or go to the war so it became a political tool and that's what john mm -hmm. wanted to change um now it's become like you said it's just ubiquitous and crazy with stores everywhere and you know one of them opened up across the street from me i thought i was on the, the starship enterprise when i went in there they're wearing headsets and uniforms and i thought i was in a spaceship Oh, and it's all corporate. It's corporatized yeah, too, yeah. right? Yeah. So yeah, yeah. You, you actually, you've gone from completely illegal and underground mm -hmm. to big cannabis. Mm -hmm. So you had big tobacco, now you have big cannabis. So, I mean, think about it. It's sort of, well, sort of Jerry Rubin. Yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, I, I wasn't <laughs> buying any myself for people to follow my lifestyle. I wasn't, in, I was with a friend. But the point of the matter is, yeah, I, I liked, you know, one point is kind of funny. They asked me to write. I wrote for High Times, even though I didn't smoke weed. I wrote these articles about how they, there was an article I did, a uh, cover story for High Times. I think it was like 2002 or something about how um, the DEA was paying TV producers in Hollywood to put in subliminal anti-drug messages into the scripts. Um, I think that's on Locals. The article's on Locals. I think I put it up there. Okay, yeah, it's like a four-page article, four-part article on on uh, the DEA uh, under General what's his name, who was the drug czar, uh, Barry Barry McCaffrey. He was the drug czar, General Barry McCaffrey, that douche. So he was paying uh, Hollywood producers under the table to put in anti-drug messages into sitcoms and dramas. Um, anyway, that, that's another story. The LA Weekly got bought, this is a number of years ago, I, I was, a, you know, I'd written for the weekly for a long time as an investigative reporter for the weekly. And it got purchased by a group that owned cannabis stores, bought the paper simply to put in cannabis ads in the paper, which they were doing anyway. The paper was being kept afloat by cannabis ads. So they figured, what the hell, they bought the whole paper. So I get a call one day, and it's these three guys who bought the paper. And they go, we're looking for an editor for the paper. I go, yeah. They go, are you willing to write three articles a week promoting cannabis? I said, no. And they said, no, come on. How hard could it be? I said, first of all, I don't smoke weed. Second of all, that's insane. I'm gonna, I mean, who who's going to read a paper? Anyway, so today they found a guy or a couple of months ago, they found a guy, I guess, who could do it and he, whoever the editor of this cockamamie thing is, there's tons of weed ads in there. There's tons of weed stores in LA. Uh, the people are still buying it from the underground dealers because they don't want to pay the tax. The whole thing has become a, a complete debacle because the government got involved in it. But are there problems with fentanyl and the underground stuff, though? Yes, yes, there is. And in fact, I found a bag of weed in a Wawa store in Palm Beach at a gas station. It was laying on the ground. I picked it up and it was like a bag of weed, a small bag. And I didn't want it, but I said, maybe my friend wants it. But but they said that it could have fentanyl in it. I went, oh, they're right. So I threw it out. But I thought, you know, you don't know if the weed's got fentanyl, Eric. I mean, fentanyl's everywhere now. It's in like, every I hate the government, but one thing about the legalization is at least you know yeah, yeah. when you're overpaying or people are overpaying for it that it won't have fentanyl, one would hope. Right. Well, don't forget, this is the same government that sprayed paraquat on marijuana fields in True. the 80s, uh, you know, which poisoned a lot of marijuana on purpose, on mm -hmm. purpose. So I don't know. So you got to be careful with that. Well, I mean, it, it, it's kind of like alcohol. I mean, uh, a, a lot of the uh, hooch back in the time could get people really sick and things like that. So I, I don't know. Did you say hooch? Yeah. Okay, I haven't heard the word hooch in a long time. I just I'm, I'm, I'm trying to speak <laughs> boomer speak for you. Speak, you. I'm trying to yeah, reach yeah, back to you. Hooch. That's like from the 1920s or something from Prohibition. Oh, let's exactly. get some. Let's get some go. hooch. We'll go down to the drugstore and get right. some hooch. Wow. But anyway, I think you can follow John online uh, with his radio channel out of Amsterdam if people want to find him. Um, and I don't know what the rest of these people are up to. I know Wayne lives here in L.A. and. Wayne developed a program called Guitars Behind Bars, where he brought in guitars into prison to teach inmates how to play guitar. I, again, what an interesting program. So he's got a lot of Jimi Hendrixes coming out of prison now, uh, forming bands, I guess. I'm not really sure. But um, 
he's all about prison reform, Wayne. That's his that's his thing. Because Are we gonna he, do a show on him? I don't know. Did we do one on him or on the MC5 or mm -mm, we I don't know. Well, he go well, if we don't, I'll just tell you this. He gets ends up going to Lexington, Kentucky, the drug prison. Uh, the yeah, he ends up getting sentenced. He plays with Johnny Thunders. He ends up getting busted selling heroin to I want to say Johnny Thunders, um, and ripping him off or something. Ends up getting sent to Lexington where Whitey Bulger is there, but he also gets free heroin at Lexington um, Federal Prison, but. He forms a band with Red Rodney, the former trumpet player who played with Charlie Parker, another heroin addict, and they have a prison band together mm. uh, in, <laughs> this is crazy, in Lexington, and they're allowed to go outside with their manager, who's a prison guard or something, to play like Knights of Columbus dances and other outside uh, events outside the prison well okay in, in fairness <laughs> if you're getting free heroin at the prison they're not really worried about him running away he'll be no back. no no. they didn't want to run away they had a <laughs> well, band point. Right. he's got a band he's got heroin i mean where's he gonna go one of the greatest <laughs> prisons of all time you know but not if you're whitey bulger not if you're forced to take a thousand hits of acid a month you know but the 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 junkies were given heroin and uh, allowed to take heroin. I, I again, it's one of the crazier programs in America, but everybody talked about it for years. I I don't know if it's still going on, but that uh, was the federal prison where they sent junkies. But they also did MK Ultra experiments in that prison under Sidney Gottlieb, which is an episode that we did, mm -hmm. uh, which has had quite a few viewers. If people want to take a look at the Sidney Gottlieb CIA. MK Ultra episode. I think it'll touch on that prison. Yeah, um, we talk about it because of uh, we did, right? Bulger and um, yeah, yeah. Bulger comes out and he was fried. His brain was completely fried by acid and and experimental drugs in the prison. When yeah, he, got he out. and Kaczynski are like the two most notorious. Well, I don't think Kaczynski didn't go to prison, though. I mean, no, 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 no. But in terms of just being fried potentially, because I don't know how much Kaczynski did as well. Hmm. Well, I, it's still a, a fascinating idea that you can go to prison and get heroin. But I think in, in Amsterdam, yeah. in Amsterdam, you can get whatever you want. You know, I think everything's been legal there for a long time. I remember going when I was over in Amsterdam, uh, visiting my cousin. We went to an Indian restaurant um, and they took out the uh, menu, leather bound menu for the dinner. And next to it was another leather bound menu of all the different types of cannabis. And you choose from that and you could just light up and then order your Indian food, which must be advantageous to the Indian restaurant because you just eat everything on the menu. You know, why not give everybody weed or let them buy weed? You know, you'll just be so hungry. You'll eat everything five times. Well, it's yeah. If you're going to put a have a bakery, why not plant it next to a dispensary? Mm hmm. Yeah, I'll be like, yeah, here you go. One stop shopping. You know what? I'm going to make a note of that, Hunley. That's a brilliant idea. I'm going to put right over here. <laughs> no, no to sell. <laughs> Here's a button that that um, John gave me. It's called Music is Revolution, and it's got the White Panther uh, logo mm. on his my button collection. It's given me by uh, John Sinclair. Um, that was a slogan he used back then, Music is Revolution. And now it's time for the subscription bell. Ah. Just, just wanted to ring that because we're going to get into a section right here uh, by our sponsor, Heroes of the Blues. Uh, appropriately for today with Sinclair. This is Rube Lacey, uh, today's hero of the blues. Rube Lacey, let's see what he did. This guy, um, John probably knows he's by heart. Rube Lacey, born in 1901 in Pelahatchee, Mississippi, learned guitar in his teens from an older performer, George Hendrix. Working out of Jackson and the Mississippi Delta became one of the state's most popular blues singers. His bottleneck efforts would inspire those of Sun House, who I saw once perform in New York. Uh, four years after recording two dance tunes for Paramount in 1928, he became a minister. He died in 1972. Uh, Rube Lacey, today's hero of the blues. Wow. All right. That's a good one. <clears throat> well, I'll... Okay, uh, um shout out our actual sponsors who are the people <laughs> like who are locals right now with Tarkina 53 sending a tip does protesting against the drag queen nuns that the Dodgers just reinvited to pride night and are giving an award to 
count <clears throat> as just doing do something slash say something? I, 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 I'm so aggravated about this thing with the nuns. <laughs> I, I, I just, I can't, I, I've been on this thing all morning with people about the nuns, the, the, the tranny nuns. I, it's just driving me freaking insane. You know, Vince Scully was a very, Vince Scully, the, the announcer for the Dodgers for over 50 years, was a very devout Catholic. And I am just glad that he is not alive today to see what this is all about. I mean, this is absolutely an outrage. Um, for people who didn't know, there's a group called um, the Trans Nuns, and they're involved in a, as a protest against the Catholic Church. Um, they dress with in white face and drag with nuns' habits as nuns, and they do all kinds of anti-Catholic things. For somebody, uh, in their infinite wisdom, decided to, to give them the Heroes of the Community Award at Dodger Stadium June 16th for Pride Night. Now, keep in mind, Pride Night is the lowest attended ethnic night of all the Dodger Stadium nights because, and this is just my theory, no one who's not gay wants to be seen on TV with people who are. And this is a very Latino Catholic fan base, very conservative. And even though it's L.A., the Dodger fan base, 43 percent of them are Hispanic Catholics. And that particular night, which is only about nine years old, there's Israeli night, there's Mexican Heritage Night, there's a black night, there's mm -hmm. every, every single ethnic thing you can imagine is a night. So they have Pride Night and the Pride Night. Is the they don't even care about baseball, first of all. Well, that's my like, thing. Is I, yeah, I don't, they, they, don't they, they don't really like it in the community. Even they don't show up for this thing because they don't want to go to Dodger Stadium. They don't Stadium. care about baseball. Right. Yeah. But so but you have a combination of people who don't want to go to be with them and the people themselves who don't want to go. Anyway, make a long story short, the heroes of the community award was supposed to go to these transgendered nuns this year. Somebody at Dodger Stadium in the front office got wind of this and got letters from uh, Marco Rubio out of Florida and the Catholic Church out of New York, and they rescinded the invitation to the transgendered nuns. They rescinded mm -hmm. it. The rest of the gay community, you would thought that they were attacked by the Japanese in 1941. Oh, yeah. They went berserk. They went berserk. And there was mm -hmm. no way out for the Dodgers. So yesterday they announced that they groveled like I've never read groveling before in an apology, and I mean groveling, um, and they rescinded it. So now, June 16th, um, which I don't know if it's a Friday night, whatever that night is, which nobody's going to go to, is now being boycotted by Catholics, um, of which there are millions and millions of Dodger fans who are Catholic in this city. There's five transgendered nuns. It was a no-brainer mm -hmm. for the Dodgers. They have now dug their own economic grave by again going woke and broke, Eric. This is this is the same as Bud Light. I mean, yeah, so, yeah. you tell me how many people in the gay slash trans community really love Bud Light. Zero. None. So why are you kissing their ass and reaching out? Oh, because you're like, oh, this is virtue points, virtue signaling. Oh, we're going to look great. And I kind of, in a twisted way, I enjoy watching their pain because they're being cynical. They're well, trying to get freebie points. And if, you're, if, if you're a Dodger fan, it's extremely painful because of the, the cross currents of political problems sure. that have happened here. Like I start to say, Vin Scully was a mm -hmm. very conservative Catholic announcer for the Dodgers. And I am just glad that he is not alive to see this happen to his beloved team. I mean, he passed away, I think, two years ago. And, mm -hmm. and he had retired five years before that, but he was still active in the Dodger community living here in L.A. And the players are Latino. The, the coaches are Latino. The season ticket holders are Latino Catholics. And then there's regular white Catholics who live here. So, I mean, it, it's probably over 50% of the attendees, over 50, are Catholic. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? It may, it may be as high as 60%, 60 or oh, 65. Because yeah. oh, yeah, yeah. I'm not, I'm just counting the Latino Catholics of sure. 40, uh, 43%. Uh, well, and, it's, and it, those who aren't Catholics, traditional Christians who a lot love baseball too, because yeah. it's a traditional sport, will also be insulted, even though they're not, Catholics, they'll still be insulted about the whole nun thing. Anyway, I hope it answered the question because I'm sick to my stomach over this thing. And I, and I, all I can do is is protest that game and 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 look at other teams and 
hopefully they'll they'll straighten this thing out um, in some way or another because this is an untenable situation. This is where if you m mix politics into sports, this is where it's going to go. They want to destroy organized sports. It's an it's a nightmare to Marxism because it gives you another thing to follow other than the Marxists. That's why they have people taking a knee. That's why they have the BLM slogan slogans in the NFL. They want to undermine organized sports. That's why transgender athletes are competing in women's sports. They want to take it down. They do not want that to be the major focus of American popular culture. There's another reason, too, because sports are the last meritocracy. They right. do well, it's not, not the last, they, but it's one of the big ones. Yeah, right. But they despise merit. That's yep. why yep. they've yep. been at it for a while. Let's remove scores from children's yep. sports. No, yep. there's no court. But the kids account score. So that's mm -hmm. that to me is a, a big part of the reason. But on a happy note, mm -hmm. cash is always nice. Yellowstone Joe gave us twenty dollars. Yellowstone Joe. Much. Yellowstone Joe. Um, Dreadnought Trucking LLC would love to hear Mark break down Ruby Ridge. I don't know anything about Ruby. Ruby Ridge. I really never covered it, so I'm not, I don't think I'm an expert on Ruby Ridge. But... And it's pretty well covered. I yeah, think, I, I, it's just not my. It's just not my thing. I don't know. Um, but, uh, on that note, though, um, we have Dustin. Dustin always goes out of his way to be here for the show. And this time he <laughs> yelled bingo at the senior center. Totally fake, but ended the game early so he could make the show. Dude, that's hysterical. That's really funny. I mean, so, bingo is a weird game. Is that like a Native American? Where does bingo come from? Does anybody know? Old people? The origins of... No, no, I know, but they were young. They were... <laughs> I, don't, I well, don't know the origins. That's the first sign of mental illness. If you laugh at your own jokes, I'm like... The, the the game comes from somewhere, Eric. I don't really know. Uh, I, I have no idea. I have no idea. How, maybe Harold, Harold knows. Ten. Harold knows for $10. Tell him what he's won, yeah. Bob. Let's see. Um, Pasha. I suspect I'll be called away in a few minutes, so I'll ask now. Heroes of the Blues of the day. Um, I know you have a personal connection to Sinclair, Mark, but what? Well, we covered that. I think we covered so, that pretty much. Well, enjoy it on the replay, Pasha. Yeah, yeah. Watch that in reverse, bro. Uh, Pat M, 1999. Thank you very much, Pat. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And Dan Hack, 1960s, the tune in, drop out generation. Tune in, drop out. Okay. Well, th these guys did not drop out. So, I mean, uh, they did active things. That was the point of the show. That's that true. They, they were very active. Well, I mean, they, they were blowing shit up, put it that way. <laughs> yeah, which we're not fans of. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Pat M. met John Sinclair at 1973, Marty Wow, Gaw. that's a long time ago. He was looking for us, mostly a U of M hangout in New Orleans. Ah. Fred Sonic Smith, the Garwood Mansion, Grandy mm -hmm. Ballroom, Easttown AA, b and J sat on stage. Ray Charles, incredible. Wow, that's a great bunch of references there. Wow. No kidding. Wow. Um, Thomas Keith, I recall the Panthers' intrepid display of black leather and shouldered rifles was in Oakland. Uh, just so, just to set the story straight, um, there was a different incident. They did patrol Oakland as a uh, ad hoc police force with shotguns. What I was talking about was going into the state legislature um, in Sacramento. A separate thing. Okay. Um, Thomas uh, Kefauver, Jay Ehrlichman's book note that he went to Nixon to sell a war on drugs as the key to infiltrating and harassing the blacks and hippies, a farce from day one. I think it goes way back before that. <laughs> I think it goes back. Well, I mean, Reaper Madness existed. An <laughs> An An Anslinger in the 1920s. I don't think it's it's Nixon's problem. I mean, he... I, I would put Hoover in there because yeah. that was all of Hoover's lifespan. He was very big on that. Yeah, yeah, it goes way, way back before that. All right, um, Greg Capella, what are your what are Mark's views? What is it? A political what, what are views? Well, I don't understand. What are my views? What it am I? A, I'm a New Yorker, man. What do you think my views are? It's a horrible, uh, horrible day. I fucking lost my lawyer in there. My friend's sponsor died in there. Any fucking thing happened. My views, you know. Um, Heather, whatever with a 499 super sticker. Thank you, Heather. Mm. Uh, Renee Ringstad with ten dollars. Thank you very much. Uh, a, there's no question here. Charles what? Sieber, what? super sticker. $10. Oh, oh, I see. You. Oh, oh, I, I'm just like, okay. <laughs> well, that, thank you. Oh, okay. Um, That's nice. That's it's very, nice. very generous. Thank you, everyone. All right. So, Freeform Friday. 
is coming up. Um, hold on. I always have to. Sold a couple Oswalds in the past couple days. You're a sellout, Oswald. Yeah, he is. He I sent you a thing. There was a country friend. band called Sons of Oswald or something. I sent you a cover Did of you? an album. Yeah, take a look. You'll see it at some point in your life when you grow up. The, okay. The, 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 I sent you some band named Oswald. Okay. Uh, I just uh, came across it. I put it in the photo things I was sending you. It was a okay. pretty funny looking uh, album cover. It wasn't the um, Dobros thing, but. It was close to that. I was looking for the. Was it? Is it? Yeah. What does that look like? Okay, I don't know if this is it, but this is the thing that. No, no, that's John. That's John signing his book to me, Guitar Army. By the way, um, not to sell any swag, but this is my movie pick of the week, which is um, Twenty to Life: The Life and Times of John Sinclair, the documentary, hmm. uh, which I think you might have to purchase. I don't know if it's on. Um, Hulu or one of these streaming services or not, but the other th book is um, Guitar Army uh, by John Sinclair, which is a, a really graphic, uh, beautifully laid laid out, countercult, incredible posters and art by a guy named Gary Grisham, who did a lot of their graphic work back in the day. Very cool. Look at this, more supers. Uh, super sticker from Kiernath, a super sticker that's not a super sticker. Hmm. What's a super sticker that's not a super sticker? I don't know. It sounds like a riddle. Hmm. And Yellowstone Joe. Is Mark a fan of the band The War on Drugs? I could have sworn we heard him quoting their lyrics on a previous show. I've never heard of it. Yeah, I'm, I'm not it wasn't me. I've never heard of the band. Well, you might have quoted lyrics that they covered. <laughs> no, I don't <laughs> It's possible. I don't know. I, I guess it's possible. <laughs> I guess it's possible, but I've never heard of the band itself. Is there a band called War on Drugs? I, I guess so. Um, um right. I've, I've never heard of them myself so if you never heard of them i never heard of them maybe it's a recent band well um oh wwoz fm was the station i was thinking of down in new orleans that john worked for um had a show for many many years wwoz fm 97.1 if i remember cool all right, so Friday. I think it's just us on Friday, right? Thank God. It's enough with these guests already. <laughs> the people, I you know, don't mind the guests, but the people turn on them. They get vicious. They just start like you know, like, it's like imagine if Huntley and Brinkley had a guest, and you go, and now the news: Huntley and Brinkley and Jeff Farge. Stevenson. No, and Jeff <laughs> and Jeff Stevenson. Who's that? A friend who's coming on to do the news with Huntley and Brinkley. I think that's why they don't like it. I guess I don't know. I, I'm I'm happy to hang out. That'd be cool. We can actually, you know, answer some questions and just have a chill show. Mm -hmm. um, Dan Hack wants more cowbell. Mm -hmm. That's more like bicycle bell, uh, Dan. But um, oh, very good. Definitely, definitely. Very good. Well, uh, on that, we'll look forward to seeing everyone Friday. If you want to donate to my uh, Lord Buckley account, you could just go on to Lord Buckley and not donate anything. It's on Twitter. You just say whatever you want. Hopefully you'll get blocked and it'll be a badge <laughs> of honor. If you but wanna, don't talk to me afterward. Do not go crying to Uncle Hunley. He's not going to save you from the blockage that's coming. If you want to donate uh, to the book fund on Venmo, PayPal, or through Hunley's own underground railroad that he operates out of a post office box, you can send him uh, the book fund money. But it all goes to a good cause, JFK books mostly, and some other books, which we're going to have to purchase at some point. So uh, that's just a shout out for that. Uh, perfect. I have PayPal too, as uh, as well. I have Venmo. <laughs> I, <won't laughs> me. Spend... <laughs> Hate me. I'm sorry. Go on. Yeah, what are you saying? I, I, I don't spend my money. <laughs> Blow me, family. <laughs> I might. I might buy groceries he, or, or or do something I, I, frivolous. I just so want to thank Viva. To I, frivolous. I, I want to thank Viva and you for buying those steaks the size of your head when we were down in Boca. <laughs> They're the biggest steaks I've ever seen in my life. I, I think I made it halfway through one of those uh, Brontosaurus burgers before I lost the will to eat anymore. So thank you, Viva, if you're out there. Happy birthday. Today's his birthday, right? Yes, today is. Yeah, happy birthday. birthday, Viva. And uh, he put up a video the other day. I think it's on Rumble. When we were walking around the Murakami uh, mm -hmm. Japanese uh, Museum, the outdoors, he was filming a bird waiting to kill a, and eat a fish. And he waits and films this thing. I, 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 you got to give it to the guy. He's just going, he's narrating the killing or the attempted killing and final killing and eating of the fish by the bird 
That's how like it's like, yeah, like a play-by-play -play sports announcer. And then his wife just shakes her head and said, I never would have had the patience for that. And it's a great little video to watch by David. Uh, very, very interesting looking. David is amazing to be around. He, his his wheels are always turning. He's always filming. He's always framing a shot or cutting a shot. Or it, it, it is, it's nonstop with him. Uh, he did tell me, and I can I figure I can share this. Right. He was laughing because he said that he was with Gad Sad driving down the highway in a jeep, mm -hmm. and he said that Gad Sad looked over to over at him and he said. You know, you're quite exhausting. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I, Dr. <laughs> a guy named Dr. Drew texted me last night, and he had Viva on. Uh, so I think it's on this morning or uh, with Drew and Viva. You may want to take a look at that. Oh, on uh, the Dr. Drew show? or Yeah, 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 yeah. Drew and Viva. He had on an RFK yesterday, and he's got Viva today. And I'm going, you're really on a roll here, Drew. And he's going, yeah, Viva's a lot of high energy, Mark. He's very, very... High energy, a lot of fun. He called him fun. I said, okay, good luck. <laughs> well, when are you going to be back at Dr. Drew? <laughs> pretty soon. I'll be back there pretty soon. Awesome. And um, Renee Ringstad, you sent a super chat. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah. She figured it out, right? Congratulations. That's you know, awesome. if you take Hunley's tutorial, which is on Rumble, on how to do super chats and achieve bigger things in life, which Hunley has a trademark on. Don't try to use that title. You could learn how to do super chats um, easily and get oh. away more of your money. He's on with Dr. Drew Lyons. right now. Yeah, that's what I was saying. Yeah, this morning he told me he was going to go. Uh, Drew told me he was having. Money. Oh, it must have been the coordination. Yeah. I mean, yeah, maybe David called him to ask if he was in the CIA like he did with me. Right. He had to coordinate. <laughs> he had to coordinate the whole thing. Now Drew lives in Pasadena, uh, not so far from from me here. So, but they're doing it electronically. Um, I don't think. I don't think this time. Viva's in town. He was here the last time. He was running around Southern California, and I didn't know he was here, so I was very disappointed. Oh, and Tarkina53 on our locals is answering the question about bingo. Oh, what is it? A game of chance named Lotto was being played in Italy by um, about 1530. Okay. And bingo, and bingo origin. 18th hmm. century is a home version called Tombola, was hmm. created in Naples with the addition of cards, tokens, and the calling out of numbers. Is that why it was in the Catholic Church? Is where I, That's where I was going with this thing with bingo, was the Catholicism of bingo. Could be. It, it's Italian Catholicism, church basement. Sure. Is that possible? I don't, I don't know. We're going to why find not? out on Friday when the whole episode is going to be Freeform Friday Bingo. We'll donate the. I hope you have a co-host. <laughs> B i n g o and bingo was his name. Hey, and on that note, I am going to go go ahead and check out um, Viva with Doctor Drew. Or if you want to hang out on this channel, I did set up a redirect for anybody that wants to watch Alex Stein. Go into Target and try on uh, women's clothes. That well, no, it's a special well. a special pocket women's bathing suits that have a pocket down below right. um, for other portions of uh, the male anatomy for reasons that nobody can explain. And apparently Target is now meeting around the clock in an emergency session, uh, realizing that they're the next victims of what I'm calling the Mulvaney effect, that they are... Yeah, get well, go broke effect. Yeah. Right. But it's more than that now. That it's, it's, oh, They're yeah. starting to rethink uh, these, these insane things that they've come up with uh, that are bringing on really quick financial losses really fast the, which i the, think is fabulous yeah I, I couldn't happen to a nicer baseball team at this point as well i can say about the dodgers <laughs> on that note yeah. we will see everybody on locals in the meantime and on friday if we don't see you there okay thank you that was fair thank you eric you're very welcome Mark. thank you hunley <laughs>